It's Sunday, January 31st in 1993. Spirits are high all across America as millions tune in to watch the 27th Super Bowl. It's a grand event. Fireworks, star players, cheering crowds, and the like. Not many would dare miss out. Karen Lewis returns home late in the evening after a weekend shopping trip with her daughter Lauren. Her husband was a massive fan of the Dallas Cowboys and was eager to watch the big game. So he stayed home. When Karen opened the front door on Sunday evening, nothing seemed to be amiss. All the lights were on. The television was on. A wedding ring and a watch lay on the kitchen counter. She opened the fridge and found a couple of freshly made turkey sandwiches. A load of clothes was spinning in the dryer. A VCR was recording the game, but no one was there to watch. The only thing missing was her husband. According to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, more than 600,000 people go missing in the United States every year. In 1993, David Glenn Lewis was added to that list. David Glenn Lewis was born on December 11, 1953 in Borger, Texas. He stayed close to home and served as an attorney and ran his own private law practice at the Potter County Courthouse. He wasn't exactly a millionaire, but with a good education, a great job, and a wife and daughter who loved him, David seemingly had little cause to complain. David seemed like a pleasant man. His peers described him as kind and good-natured, he took part in a number of charitable organizations and often attended church. Law is hard work, and on many occasions, David voiced how much he'd been struggling with the pressure. That, coupled with the high-stress environment of a courthouse, and it's easy to see how he could be a stressed-out man. Not only that, but David also taught government classes at Amarillo College until as late as 10 p.m., so he was sometimes coming home very late in the evening. So, apart from a demanding job and a burning passion for the Dallas Cowboys, David seems like a normal, pleasant man. Everything seemed fine until that fateful night in 1993. It's Thursday, January 28, 1993, and Karen Lewis and her daughter Lauren are off to Dallas for a weekend of shopping. David stays home because it's Super Bowl Sunday. He finished work earlier that day at Buckner, Lara, and Swindell, where he was working as a lawyer, because he was not feeling well. A few hours later, he was off to his other job, where he was teaching night school at Amarillo College. On the way, he stopped at a gas station to fill up and continued on to Amarillo. Classes ended at 10 p.m., and then he drove home. Everything seemed normal. On January 31st, his wife Karen and her daughter returned to Amarillo from a weekend of shopping in Dallas. When she opened the door to her home, she noticed that the television was on and the lights were on as well. David's wedding ring is on the kitchen counter and fresh turkey sandwiches are ready in the fridge. However, David is not home. The Super Bowl was on, so it was likely he was staying at a friend's house or at work. The next morning on Monday, February 1st, Karen gets a call from Buckner, Lara, and Swindell saying that David missed two appointments and didn't show up for work. Karen is worried about David, so she notifies the police that he is missing. That day, the police begin their investigation and search for David Glenn Lewis. Now we are getting to the point where the police had to find out what happened between January 28th and February 1st. As we already know from witnesses, on January 28th, he taught classes until 10 p.m. and then went home. After the search began, an eyewitness who knew David from church contacted the police. He said he saw him rush through Southwest Airlines Terminal at Amarillo Airport on January 29th. According to the witness, David had no luggage and appeared confused. 
On January 30th, police checked David's bank accounts and found that someone had deposited $5,000 into his account. Unfortunately, it could not be determined who had deposited the money. The following day on January 31st, 1993, someone purchased two airline tickets in the name of David Glenn Lewis. One was for a flight from Dallas to Amarillo that same day. The other was purchased the following day for a flight from Los Angeles to Dallas, with a stopover in Amarillo. But the police could not say for sure whether David bought it directly, because in 93, you didn't have to show any idea to buy a ticket in the US. Also, in the 1990s, it was impossible to verify if they were even used. Another interesting fact is that at 5.15 p.m., someone turned on the Super Bowl video recording at the Lewis family home. The video recorder must have been turned on manually because in those years, video recorders couldn't start automatically. Now we come to February 1st, when Karen reported her husband missing. On this day, the police received a report from the deputy sheriff himself that he had seen a man who matched David's description. According to the deputy sheriff, he was taking pictures of a red Ford Explorer parked in front of the Potter County Court's building. Later, another witness of the incident contacted the police. A taxi driver said that on February 1st, he was driving a man who also matched David's description to Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. He said he was very nervous and was holding a stack of $100 bills, one of which he used for the fare. On February 2nd, the police found David's red Ford Explorer in front of the Potter County Courts building in downtown Amarillo. His keys, driver's license, checkbook, and credit cards were left inside the car. During her statement, Karen told the police that David would not voluntarily leave their family or that he would not disappear without telling them where he was going. He was a devoted husband and father. However, Karen stated that David was scheduled to fly to Dallas during the first week of February to testify in court. His former law firm, Ham, Irwin, Graham and Cox, was in the middle of a trial. It was a $3 million conflict of interest lawsuit. As a lawyer, he also received a lot of threats in the past, but according to the police, none of them were connected to his disappearance. The trail runs cold after this. If you're left scratching your head trying to piece together all the clues, you're not alone. The police in 1993 could find no extra information on the disappearance of David Glenn Lewis. Nothing more came to light, and nobody testified of having seen the man since the night of Super Sunday. He'd seemingly vanished into thin air. Seeing no alternatives, the police abandoned the investigation, and after a difficult mourning period, his family moved on. The case was closed and remained that way for 11 years, until a man named Pat Ditter sat on his couch, turned on his television, and switched to CBS. On February 1st, 1993 in Yakima, Washington, halfway across the country from Dumas, where police were frantically trying to piece together the story of David's disappearance, a car was heading down State Road 24 in the dead of night. The driver spotted a man in camo gear and boots walking in the middle of the road in the pitch black dark. It was beyond a strange sight to see, let alone incredibly dangerous. The driver initially passed the man, but then decided to turn around and check to see if he was all right. By the time the driver drove back to the initial location where he'd seen the man, he saw only a corpse lying in a pool of blood by the side of the road and a Chevy Camaro speeding off into the distance. The police arrived on the scene but couldn't identify the body. On the man's person was nothing outside of the ordinary, just a pair of glasses. Officers also found nothing that could lead them back to the Chevy Camaro that had fled the scene. They deemed the case a hit and run and buried the unidentified man under the name John Doe. In 2004, Detective Pat Ditter became obsessed with the TV series Without a Trace. The show focused on uncovering the truth behind missing persons cases. He wanted to do the same in real life, 
so we found an old unresolved case of a missing attorney from Dumas, Texas. Slowly but surely, Pat began piecing it together. He noticed that the man who'd been killed in Washington fit the description of David Glenn Lewis. In a moment of genius, Pat asked to see the list of items found on the Washington man's body. To his shock, he found what he'd been looking for. A pair of glasses that looked exactly like David's. The lab ran some DNA tests, and sure enough, the match was confirmed. Over a decade of fruitless questions and speculation had come to an end. To say the final piece of the puzzle was slotted into place would hardly be true. There are still many questions lingering over this case that remain unanswered. Why did David flee in the first place? Why did he take photos of his car in front of the courthouse? He was watching and recording the game when it was on. So why did he suddenly decide to leave? Who left $5,000 in his account? The more likely answer is that David had become paranoid. The stress of his work and the death threats had gotten to him. He'd probably devised an escape plan months ago, but had yet to follow through on it. So, in a moment of panic, and seeing potential assassins in every shadow, he dropped everything and made a run for it. Maybe during his travels, he came to his senses and tried to find his way back home. As for the Chevy, it was dark and it probably struck David by accident. Its driver probably got scared and drove off to avoid prosecution. Had he been just a bit lucky, David might have returned home to his wife and daughter and the whole thing would have been chalked up as a mad episode. Sadly, David's luck had run out, and the truth behind his disappearance and death will likely remain lost to us forever.